I ask you to take your Bible, if you will, and turn with me to the book of James, chapter 2. James, chapter 2. We've been in James for the last few Wednesday nights and plan to be for some time to come, uh, working just verse by verse through the book of James. Tonight, I want us to look at verses 10 through 13 of James, chapter 2, verses 10, 11, 12, and 13. James, chapter 2, beginning at verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Now call your attention back to verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, is guilty of all. We're going to talk to you tonight about only one sin. Only one sin. Father, thank you so much for blessing us again. Send your sweet and blessed Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide. And forgive us our sins, for they are many. And help us, Lord, to be surrendered to you and to be listening to you. And guide us in all truth and strengthen our faith, we pray. Always, Father, we pray if anyone's listening who doesn't know you as Savior, that they would open their heart and trust you. Now we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep your Bible open, if you will, James 2. I'm going to talk to you quite a bit about some other scripture, and we may turn a page or two. But uh, just stay with me as I talk to you for just a little bit so we can fully understand what we're looking at in this passage. First of all, I want to, we're talking about sin, only one sin. I want to give you a definition of sin. Sin is the thought or the action of doing that which is a violation of and in rebellion to the will of God as revealed in the Word of God. Sin is the thought or the action of doing that which is a violation of and in rebellion to the will of God as revealed in the Word of God. It is the decision to do what we know to be wrong. I'm going to give you a scripture reference and we'll come back to it in a little bit. Ezekiel 18.4. It is also the ignorant violation of God's word. What do you mean the ignorant of violation of God's word? I mean you can sin and not realize that you're sinning. The Bible calls it a sin of ignorance. Well, where does it talk about that? Glad you asked. That would be Leviticus 4 verses 2 through 27. Leviticus 4 verses 4, uh, I'm sorry, verses 2 through 27. And talks about sins of ignorance. I'm going to make another statement. All sin bears the death penalty. I read just uh, yesterday, I think it was, that for the first time in many, many years, uh, five people are going to be executed uh, for crimes that they've been convicted of in the next seven days. Of course, less than seven days now. And they said that hasn't happened in many years. Now, I'm not going to get off on, on uh, death penalty, whether it's right or wrong or that kind of thing right now. That's not the point. But I think it's odd that some of these people, their crimes were committed a long time ago. One person, individual, I believe they said they were convicted in 1994. Can you imagine that? 1994, and now they're executing him. I understand. He didn't just commit the crime in 94. He was convicted in 94. That's a very, very long time. But sin, all sin, bears the death penalty. I've heard a lot of preachers, and I listen to preachers, listen to other preachers a lot. Sometimes people say to me, you ought to listen to other preachers. Well, I do. I do listen to other preachers. But I often talk about the four men who are my favorite preachers as far as their delivery and of a sermon and so forth. And one of them, Dr. Fred Brown, who was an evangelist, he was never a pastor. He was never uh, the president of a college and not that there's anything wrong with either one of those. But he was just always an evangelist for over 60 years. 
And on one occasion, I heard him say this, and I'm going to repeat this a couple more times before we're over, before we're finished tonight, I meant to say. He said, one sin has enough power to condemn your soul for all eternity. Let me run that by you again. One sin has enough power to condemn your soul for all eternity. Now, we're talking about only one sin tonight, only one sin. There are many people who would argue with that statement. They'd say, well, that's not true. It's not true that one sin can condemn your soul for all eternity, but those people would be wrong in light of the Word of God. Now, there is one system of theology, and it's a major system of theology that teaches that there are two major classifications of sin. Two major classifications of sin. Uh, I'm going to give you some direct quotation. My source for this is a website that's titled Catholic Answers. And I'm not picking on anybody tonight. I'm just trying to help you to understand how a lot of people think. That website has an article talking about venial sin, B-E-N-I-A-L, venial sin versus mortal sin. Venial sin is defined as, quote, a less serious matter. He does not deserve the standard prescribed by the moral law or when he disobeys the moral law in a grave manner, but without full knowledge or complete consent. So that last part means it's a sin of ignorance. So you didn't know it was wrong, but it's still a sin. Well, that's a venial sin. Uh, and then the first part of the definition, a less serious matter, does not observe the standard prescribed by the moral law, but it's really not all that bad. Now, what else is a venial sin? A venial sin is one that does not bear the death penalty. I mean spiritual death. In other words, you, you just commit a venial sin, you can be forgiven, and all sin can be forgiven, but you will not go to hell for a venial sin. By contrast, the same article defines mortal sin as, quote, results in the privation of sanctifying grace, that is, of the state of grace. If it is not redeemed by repentance and God's forgiveness, it causes exclusion from Christ's kingdom and the eternal death of hell. So that's a mortal sin. So venial sin isn't, isn't so bad. And you're not going to hell for a venial sin, though you do need to be forgiven. But uh, by contrast, you commit a mortal sin, you're going to hell. Now, the same source, just after what I just read to you, has another paragraph labeled, quote, what does the Bible say, end quote. I don't want you to listen carefully. They give an answer to the question, what does the Bible say, Matthew 5, 19. Matthew 5, 19 says, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And the paragraph goes on to say this. Our Lord here teaches that there are least commandments a person can break and even teach others to do so and still remain in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, saying there are certain sins, these are these venial sins, that a person can commit and still remain in the kingdom of heaven. It goes on to say this is both a good definition of the venial sin and perfectly in line with paragraph uh, 1863 of the Catechism. Then it says Jesus goes on to warn us in no uncertain terms that there are other sins, the mortal sins, that will take us to hell if we do not repent. If we do not repent, of course. For example, Matthew 5, 22 says, Whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Now, I'm going to say part of that is right and, and part of it is wrong. And let me help you with something there. If you take truth and you mix it with error, you ruin the truth. Let me give you another example of that. Suppose, uh, I, I'm just curious. How many of you how many of you like chocolate milk? Anybody raise your hand? There's a few of you. Some of you didn't raise your hand. That's okay. You don't have to. That leaves more for the rest of us. But uh, the truth is, suppose I had a, a nice glass of milk 
and I say I want to I'll make it chocolate. Now you can get, I guess you can, I haven't in ages, but I guess you can still get Nestle's powder and put it in and make chocolate milk. I, I suppose you can still do that. But uh, let's let's assume you can. But instead of getting a spoonful or so of Nestle's powder and mixing the milk, suppose I get a spoonful of dirt and mix in the milk. Now, do you want it? it? It'll look like chocolate. Do you want it? No, you don't want it. Why? It's got dirt in it. But if the milk is still milk, right? So why don't you want it? The dirt ruined it, didn't it? It's the same thing when we mix error with truth. It discolors and disflavors the truth. It, it, it damages the truth. Now, I think it's interesting that the author of that article went from Matthew chapter 5, verse 19 to Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, and he bypassed Matthew 5, 20 and 21. Say, well, haven't you ever done something like that? Yes, of course I have. But listen to Matthew 5, 20 and 21, because remember, the author is saying with Matthew 5, 19, 5, 22, that this proves that there are venial sins, sins that don't bear the death penalty, and then there are mortal sins, sins that do bear the death penalty. But here's what Matthew 5, 20 and 21 say. Jesus speaking, quote, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed be greater than, exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you're more righteous than the scribes and Pharisees, you're not even going to be in the kingdom of heaven. That's verse 20. Listen to verse 21. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. What judgment? The judgment of God. Now, you could take verse 20 by itself and you say, well, that proves a mortal sin. Well, what are you going to do with verse, verse 19? Except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into, in no wise, in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You're not even going to be there. You've got to be more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees. You, it's not enough to just not be a murderer. You've got to be more righteous than the scribes and Pharisees. Now, if you study the scribes and the Pharisees, morally speaking and socially speaking, they were about as above reproach as anybody. But you got to be better than that. I'm telling you that rather than support the idea of venial sins as opposed to mortal sins, the Lord Jesus teaches in this passage that all sins are in reality mortal sins. In other words, all sin bears the death penalty. Now, I gave you two references earlier, Ezekiel 18.4 and Romans 6.23. Listen carefully to Ezekiel 18.4. Ezekiel 18.4, God says, Behold, all souls are mine, comma. Why did you give comma? Because I want you to pause in your thinking there. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth. The soul that sinneth doesn't say what sin, doesn't say a venial sin, a mortal sin, doesn't say what sin. It just says the soul that sinneth, the soul who sinneth, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. What's going to die? The soul. What does that mean? Does that mean they're going to hell? That's exactly what it means. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now that's Ezekiel 18.4. Listen to Romans 6.23. You know this one. For the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I said I put forth the theory that one sin has enough power to condemn your soul for all eternity and Told you I was quoting Fred Brown, but where did he get that from? Well, I'm going to tell you he got it from James chapter 2, verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all, as if you violated all of it. But some people say, well, I've heard that there is an unpardonable sin, a sin that God will not forgive. Well, you heard correctly. I'm going to talk to you about that. You can write down this reference if you want to. I'm, I'm not going to take time to make you turn there. But 
maybe jot down this reference. Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 to 32. By the way, you probably should start at verse 24 to get the whole picture. So Matthew 12, verses 24 to 32. But in Matthew 12, 31, Jesus said, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. How much? All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, that's the Lord Jesus, it shall be forgiven him, but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. That sounds eternal to me. What do you think? Yeah. No forgiveness. Now, it's clear in these two verses that the one unpardonable sin is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But that raises a question. What exactly is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? I'm going to tell you, uh, if you go out and read uh, five or six commentaries, you probably get five or six answers to that question. How do you know? Because I've looked at them. Well, let's break it down a little bit. The word blasphemy itself, and whether you're coming from Hebrew, Greek, or English, it, it's all the same. It means to speak with contempt, to speak with contempt, or to speak with intention of injury. To speak with intention of injury. You know how we phrase that today? We call that verbal assault. That's to speak with intent of injury. Now, there have been, as I said, many theories about what constitutes the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, but I think we can get some clues from Scripture itself. There's no better place to look. So Matthew chapter, I said 24 earlier, 22, Matthew 12, 22 to 30, indicates that the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is giving credit to the prince of devils for the work of the Spirit of God. Let me run that by you again. Giving credit to the prince of devils for the work of the Spirit of God. Well, where did you get that? Read Matthew 12, 22 to 30. In verse 28 of that passage, it says, uses the phrase, the prince of devils. Some people have said this was a sin that could only be committed by the Pharisees in Jesus' time. If you look at verse 24 of that passage, and we're not turning there for sake of time, but you look at verse 24, there's logic to that view. But let me show you some other things. Because the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 15, if this is a sin that could only be committed by the Pharisees in Jesus' time, listen to 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 15. By the way, Paul writes 1 Timothy many years, decades after the Lord Jesus has been here, for 33 years, was crucified, buried, rose again, and ascended back to heaven. It's decades later that Paul writes 1 Timothy. How many decades? Four or five. 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 15, Paul writes, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer. Paul says, me, I was a blasphemer, and not only that, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. Isn't that part of what it means to be a blasphemer, to speak in an injurious way? But, he says, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Key, key phrase there, in unbelief. He goes on, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundantly with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now, listen to what he says. Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners. And he says, I'm the chief of sinners. He says, I was a blasphemer. I was injurious. He said, I persecuted the church. I did all of that. And yet, the Lord forgave me. Now, that's not all. Remember the theory 
that this sin could only have been committed by the Pharisees in Jesus' time? Well, Paul writes this long after Jesus' time. But in Philippians chapter 3, verse 5, guess what? Paul identifies himself as a Pharisee. He says, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee. Now, listen to this. When was Paul a Pharisee? Not when he wrote Philippians, not when he wrote 1 Timothy, but he was, was he a Pharisee when Jesus was here? The answer is yes. He was one of them. He was a Pharisee. No doubt about it. Hmm. Well, maybe he wasn't one of the ones who, who blasphemed. Well, he says he was a blasphemer. Well, let's look for something else. I'm going to put forth the theory that the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the rejection of Jesus Christ, whom the Holy Spirit, to whom the Holy Spirit gives witness. Listen to John 16, 14 and 1 John 5, 6. Each of them tell us the Holy Spirit bears witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we reject the Lord Jesus Christ, we reject the witness of the Holy Spirit. And what about the miracles that Jesus did? Do we not then attribute them to whom? The prince of devils? If the Holy Spirit didn't do those miracles, who did? See, that whole thing came about when Jesus cast some demons out of people and some of the Pharisees said he does that by the power of Beelzebub. You know what Beelzebub literally translates as? Lord of the Flies. Well, that's a high title, isn't it? How would you like to be called that? You see, John 3.36 says, and listen carefully, this is John the Baptist speaking, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Clear statement, wouldn't you say? He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. That sounds like eternal condemnation to me. What do you think? Yeah, he that believeth on the Son has everlasting life, but he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, not even going to see it. You know, Moses didn't get to go to the promised land, but he got to see it. Well, these folks aren't even going to see it. The wrath of God abides on them. Now, with all of that as a backdrop, look at verse 10. We're going to go quickly here. James 2, verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. There are, it's been counted in the Old Testament, 613 commandments. That does not count the commandments given in the New Testament. And uh, there's people who have said, oh, there are no New Testament commandments. Well, and you look in Gospel of John chapter 13 and Jesus says, a new commandment give I unto you. That sounds like a New Testament commandment to me. What do you think? So 613 in the Old Testament commandments, and those are the ones that James is referring to here. So he says, if you break one of them, I'm going to stand here and tell you, quite honestly, I can't even name all 613 commandments. I can't. I know a lot of them, but I sure don't know half of them. Not by where I could just quote it to you. Say, well, aren't a lot of those about when you should wash your hands and, and, and how to clean up from leprosy and all? Yeah, that's part of it. But what is James saying here? He's saying, whosoever shall keep the whole law, you keep 612 out of 613. Now, that's pretty good, wouldn't you say? Suppose you were playing baseball and you came to bat and 612 out of 613 times you hit a home run. You know what you'd be? You'd be in the Baseball Hall of Fame. That's what you'd be. You would. That's 612 out of 613 is good. Most of the time. But look what James says here. Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. So if you break one out of the 613, you're guilty of the whole 613. That's what he said. Why? Because you have violated the word and the will of God. Period. 
Say, yeah, but aren't some of those commandments less of a sin than others? Well, that's the whole venial mortal sin argument, isn't it? But you know, when it says the wages of sin is death, it doesn't specify which sins, does it? Let me share with you a couple other thoughts here. We'll finish up. Verse 11. For he that said, and verse 11 is an illustration of verse 10. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, well, that's good. Put you on good moral ground. You never committed adultery. That's good. Yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. That's kind of hard to argue with, isn't it? I never committed adultery. Yeah, but you murdered somebody. Yeah, but I never committed adultery. Doesn't really work, does it? Verse 12. James says, So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Now, the law of liberty is mentioned earlier here in verse 25 of this same chapter. But it says it's going to be judged by the law of liberty. If we were to go over to Revelation chapter 20, it tells us about people standing at the great white throne judgment. It tells us the books were opened and the people were judged by the books, what was written in them. Well, what books are those? Well, some people said it's the book of man's sin is one of them and the book of life is another, but it's the Bible. Well, that may be right. I'm, I'm not going to argue with that. That may be right. But all it is needed is the Bible. Because you know what the word Bible means? Somebody tell me. What does the word Bible mean? It means book of books. That's what it literally means. It comes from the Greek word biblos. Yeah, that's a good acrostic that you gave. But it's the Greek word biblos, and it means book of books. What is the Bible? It is a book of books. And what does it say in Revelation 20? The books were open and the judge were, uh, the dead were judged out of the things written therein. So maybe the book of man's sin is there. I'm not going to say it's not. And certainly the book of life is there because it clearly states that in that same passage. But the only thing that's needed to judge us is that they open the books. And here it is. Therefore, if we don't measure up to everything in the Bible, we're guilty of sin. And if we sin in one sin, only one sin, guilty of the whole. And that's time for round two. Now, verse 13. For he shall have judgment without mercy. Who's going to have judgment without mercy? He shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. The person who doesn't show mercy will be judged without mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. What does that mean? It means mercy is coming up against judgment, and thereby we can be forgiven, we can be saved because of God's mercy. Well, what does it mean in the first part of the verse? He shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy. Well, to understand that, I want you to go back just a few verses here. And we looked at this last time. Look at verse 8. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. Well, what is that? Look at verse 13. He shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. Well, if you don't love your neighbor as yourself, you have not showed mercy, have you? The answer is no, I haven't. So that person who doesn't show mercy is going to have judgment without mercy. But mercy rejoiceth against judgment. So then, we keep the entire law. And so if we keep the entire law, then we enter into the kingdom of God, right? No. Listen to Galatians 3, 21, 22. Paul writes, Is the law then against the promises of God? Is the law against the promises of God? Because the law condemns us. Is it against the promises of God? He says, God forbid. 
Listen carefully. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, barely righteousness should have been by the law. If the law could have given life, then we'd be righteous by keeping the law. That's Galatians 3.21. Listen to Galatians 3.22. But the scripture, the Bible, the scripture, the law, the scripture hath included, uh, I'm sorry, hath concluded, scripture hath concluded all under sin. Well, I, what if I keep the law? Well, you got to go back to verse 10. Whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So those who believe get the promise through Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to say it again. One sin can condemn the soul for all eternity. But we are not found guilty of only one sin. We're found guilty of the whole. James 2.10 But only one Savior can forgive all our sin and save the soul from death and hell. Listen to Hebrews 7.25. We're finished tonight. Hebrews 7.25 Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost. Now, some people say that means save them all over the world. Well, you could take it that way, but that's really not the main emphasis here. When it says save them to the uttermost, it means save them completely. Take away all their sin. Wherefore is able also to save them to the uttermost, who? That come unto God by him, seeing he... Jesus Christ ever liveth to make intercession for them. So, one sin, only one sin, has enough power to condemn your soul for all eternity. But Jesus Christ is the only one who can take away all your sin. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you that we have the opportunity to look into your word. And help us, Lord to keep in mind your mercy and your grace, your love toward us, and that you forgive us by grace through faith, faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now help us, Lord, as we go to bring before your throne the prayer requests that have been shared tonight and other things that may be on our heart that we've not shared with each other. Blessing this season of prayer, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.